our time today just again giving ourselves the opportunity to think a little bit about how must we live in light of this resurrection and uh, for the next several weeks we'll be able to do so I will say a quick word about our guests next week next Sunday one of our uh, alumni members I guess you would say she uh, graduated from Yale Divinity School after she uh, was here at the way at UC Berkeley for some years I believe her call to ministry was affirmed here and she was a great uh, proponent for social justice and all kinds of things. She started her own t-shirt company during the era of Black Lives Matter that everybody all across the country were buying t-shirts through her gloss racks company. And now she is a huge advocate for uh, women's reproductive health and rights and, and has merged that with, I think, a very powerful theological framework. She is working on a big project to help churches understand how to be more responsive to those who are uh, struggling with how to make sense of bodily autonomy, women's reproductive health, and their faith. And so she's going to be here next week preaching, but also after service is going to start a bit of a conversation that she will come back in the summer and do almost a month-long study with those who are willing to sit with her and share their stories and and uh, do a little bit of constructive, we call it constructive theological work. Um, because uh, there is indeed the case that uh, the faith that we've been uh, discipled into, socialized to, uh, often has some gaps that uh, require us to, one of our words around here, de-churchify. We gotta, we gotta do a little bit of uncoupling and a little bit of exploration and a little bit of of excavation and also a little bit of reimagining and reinterpreting our faith, uh, not changing certainly the core theological assumptions, but just appreciating that any faith that does not bring life is a faith that you ought to leave in the grave. Hello, somebody. Amen. And so I'm super excited to have Minister Ryan, Reverend Ryan here with us next week. Come on out. And I think it'll be an amazing, amazing time. And it's not just for uh, our sisters. Amen. It's also for all of us who are men and partners and companions too, who have daughters, who have aunties and grandmas and mothers. The conversation around reproductive health and bodily autonomy is critically important for all of us as a community to think about, to lean into. I have two daughters and Lord knows. I don't want nobody all making decisions about their body, amen. Amen. At any age, praise God. Especially while they in my house, amen. I believe in nonviolence. Just don't push me. Somebody say amen, right? All right. John chapter 20 is where we'll spend our time today. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most powerfully relevant passages of Scripture for all of us who live in the immediate aftermath of Easter Sunday and resurrection. Because often... These Sundays, these high holy days, if you will, are moments where many of us make these new commitments, right? To I need to just jump in and lean in with my faith, even the more so. And you get a big high, a big experience. How many ever had a big uh, spiritual experience and you was just on cloud nine? You felt like you could just run into hell, amen, and just 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 tear the devil up, amen. It's like, oh, I oh, just point me in the devil's direction. <laughs> the devil gonna have a problem, right? And then, you know, about a week later, you like, man, I'm tired. That 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 high went away. Anybody feel like that? It's like, you know, I was spiritually on the high and now I'm kind of back in a normal situation. Well, that is your humanity. That is our humanity kind of reminding us that it's very difficult to live on a persistent high. That the whole point of a high is that it likely is temporary. I know some of us are in love, have been in love, want to be in love, and we just believe that, man, the love we got is just going to keep us on a high. I know some of y'all been puff puff past a little bit and you thought, man, this is going to keep me on a high. 
But do I got the witness that says it always comes down? Somebody say amen, right? That don't mean it's useless. It just means that there's an ebb and flow. All right. Well, here we have an ebb and flow. And uh, we have the disciples of Jesus literally saw Jesus dead on a Friday, Thursday, Friday, walking around town on a Sunday. And a week later, we're picking up this story in John chapter 20. Let's see what the scripture says. When it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, listen to this, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So just to, again, paint the picture for you, they literally a week after seeing something so magnanimous, so magnificent, so supernatural, I'm sure they were on a high and about a week later, Jesus wasn't around, the Roman soldiers were still around, and their response was to go lock themselves in a room because they had fear, had returned, and literally caused them to be hiding. Let's keep reading. Jesus comes, stands among them, and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Verse 22, and when Jesus said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Verse 24, but Thomas, everybody say, but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in Jesus sighed, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them this time. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to talk from the topic for about 20 minutes, then we're going to take communion and uh, pick it up again the following weeks to come. But today I want to talk about believe it before you see it. God, thank you for the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing. That makes the preaching and the teaching easy. May it, may it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Somebody holler, believe it before I see it. <clears throat> now, there is a natural human tendency to need 
to see evidence before you place your life in the hands of something that is not known to you. It is not a pejorative, it is not a criticism, it is just how most of us are wired. There are a few of us who some may describe as gullible, who just throw their life in anybody's hands. But you know, it's like, if you've grown up a little sheltered, no shade to all of us who grew up sheltered, you know, you just have not learned yet the machinations of human behavior. You just think everybody shows up like you do. Well-meaning, truthful, not intending to do harm. So you show up that way until you find yourself connected to somebody who is a piece of work. Somebody say amen. amen. They can't handle the preciousness of your humanity. They can't show up with integrity, consistency. When the pressure is on, they are often cracking and allowing their human foibles to shine through. And because we've had so many encounters with those kind of folk, how many of you know you kind of immediately start to throw up some defense mechanisms? Like, no, I heard that game before. <laughs> so you're gonna have to prove yourself. I ain't gonna like, you know, just let you all into my space because you got a silver tongue. Because you know how to put it. You got some game. You, 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 you got a nice presentation. I mean, there are moments in our lives where folk can talk us into something that after you get into it, you wish you never met them. There are some investments you will make you might invest some money in your friend or family's hair, brain, idea. And it, it looked great. It was like, ooh, I'm coming up. This $10 is about to make me a millionaire. I knew. I remember when penny stocks came out. And I just had all these friends or, 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 or what's, what's the other stuff? Uh, the, 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 the crypto stuff, you know. Everybody just, you know, a get rich quick scheme. And I find it interesting that there is no such thing as a get-rich-quick scheme. That the overwhelming number of billionaires are billionaires because they inherited the wealth of their family. Hello, somebody. And all of us who are so invested in capitalism thinking, if I could just work hard and play by these rules, I'm going to become this uber-wealthy person. You just got to acknowledge that you're more likely to be struck by lightning a few times. I don't mean no harm to nobody. <laughs> but you don't have to be a billionaire in order to have a sustained quality of life. Amen. Right? That there is a value that we've placed on a capitalistic measurement of success whereby we all find ourselves seduced in the rat race. But the problem with the rat race is at the end of the race, you still a rat. <laughs> Hello, somebody. There must be something bigger and greater to our lives than just trusting that which has proven to not be trustworthy. And I want to submit to you, beloved, that Resurrection is so fascinating. Easter is so fascinating because, as I've shared, we who follow the ebbs and flows of our Christian faith, we're consciously aware of these moments in history that our faith reminds us of where God literally breaks into our status quo, upends it with some kind of miraculous action, and then God fades back into the background. And then we left to deal with, man, what did I just see? 
Again, there are moments in your life where you know that things have happened and it was not because of your own skills. Hello, somebody. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you feel like everything that's happened in my life, I planned it. <laughs> I don't know. The work that I do across the country, you know, people ask me all the time, Pastor Mike, how did you end up doing this? I said, I don't know. I had a vision that I believe God gave me for my life and my call, and I trusted that if I was faithful over the things God placed in my hand, God would guide my steps. If someone told me 20 years ago that some of the things that we be doing, that I be leading, that we've been accomplishing, some folks laughed at us. I remember one of my first sermons here in 2005 when I came back from Duke. I was, you know, you know, younger, skinnier, <laughs> more radical, if you can believe that. I used to be in the neighborhood, and I met all these youngsters who was, you know, involved in violence and shooting and stuff. And I remember one Sunday I was preaching, and I just was, I was just, you know, I, I, you know back then I used to just like shake the mic, and I, you know, I would just preach like that for 45 minutes straight, just <laughs> boundless energy. Amen. <laughs> what a time. But I remember one time I was preaching, I was thinking about this because I was telling the story to a, a, a person that's doing some recollection of, of the work we've led around gun violence. And I remember I said, in 10 years, we're gonna, we're gonna, gonna, gonna cut violence in half here in the Bay Area. And you know, the church was going crazy and folks were swinging from the chandeliers and speaking in tongues and we shouting and, and we, you know, I, it was just a good Sunday. And you know, I was so high in what I was saying. You know, I went into the meetings with the mayor and the police chief and I didn't have no sense of how we was gonna do what I said we was gonna do. But I do believe it was a God idea that was birthed in the desires of my heart that were aligned with what I believe God was up to. And literally 10 years later, we were seeing 30 and 40 and 50% reductions in gun violence in this area and now the work is literally going national. Now, it is not a suggestion because I said it. I do believe it's about there are moments where we are being asked and compelled by God to believe a thing that God is up to before you can see it. Now, why is that important? Because there are lots of things going on in the world today that you can see that are an exact opposite of what God is up to. There are a lot of things happening in your personal journey that is opposite of what you know God has placed in your heart. There's a lot of things happening in your family, your relationship, your vocation, your career, and you know, man, this don't line up <laughs> with what I know God. God brought me all the way out to this crazy berserkly. I didn't come out here to flunk out of school now. I didn't come out here to be, you know, out here struggling the way I'm struggling. I didn't come out here to be victimized by violence and injustice and, and, and doubt and worry and concern. God, there's something else that you've placed in my heart that has not yet manifested. And I want you to know, beloved, God is inviting you to believe it before you see it. Because if you believe a thing before you see it, you will live your life differently. Yeah. While that thing is coming to pass. Do I, do, I, do I have any witnesses in here today? Then? You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm in here working around all these wicked people, but I know that this thing I'm putting together, it's in spite of them. <laughs> they some haters, I ain't thinking about these haters. They, they're, they're some obstructionists, but I'm not thinking about their obstruction. Why? Because God has put something in my mind, uh -huh. in my heart, in my spirit. God has brought together all my skills and experiences 
my trials, my tribulations, my victories, my defeats. God has brought it all together because God is getting ready to manifest something. That I can't see it, but I'm being asked to believe it. I want you to know, child of God, that it's hard to be on a high and come down low and still hold on to your faith. (laughs) It's just human. You know, sometimes we come to church and we just forget that these are just some human dudes. Human sisters, human loved ones. They're not no supernatural people. I know because of the the, the, the magnanimity, the, uh, the, the, uh, the excellence of their faith. Through history, we give them titles like Apostle Paul, Saint Mary. And it's like, ooh, it was some spiritual people. But I want you to know they were only regarded that after they died <laughs> by people who did not live their life. They had such an exemplary way of life that after the fact, folks venerated them and said, we ought to elevate them as an example that if God can move through them this way, Uh listen, God can move through us. They didn't have no extra spirituals power than you do today. They They didn't have a double dose of the Holy Ghost. And you just got a single scoop. (laughs) They didn't. They just, all they had was a faith. A faith that had capacity to grow. And you have that same faith. You may have faith the size of a mustard seed, Jesus said. I want you to think about it. I wish I had some mustard seeds. I'll show you how small. Y'all, y'all know, y'all, who, how many of y'all cook? You, 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 you ever use any mustard seeds? Or think of, think of, how many of you get, get them little pastries with the little black, black little pepper things on them or whatever that speck stuff is? Whatever it is, spices. Seeds. <laughs> Jesus said, if you have faith the size of that, listen to what Jesus said now, you could literally say to a mountain, Be removed. And that mount will have to listen to you. Now, either Jesus was a liar. Jesus was psychologically deranged. Or some of us ain't using our mustard seed faith. Now, I want to believe we don't got too many folk in here who believe Jesus is a liar. Because I wouldn't be hanging out on a Sunday if I thought Jesus was a liar. I'd be... Watching the final four or something, I don't know. <laughs> Reading a book. Hiking up to one of these trails. I don't think we believe Jesus is deranged. You know, I think we wouldn't be following after a deranged man. I think we just don't believe that we have faith that can move mountains. How can I activate my faith? So I can believe a thing before I see it. Well, the scripture gives us a couple of hints that I want to lift up. Uh, It's in light of resurrection. It's in light of Easter. It's in light of the powerful display of Jesus' power. That Jesus is not inviting you to create your own formula. Jesus is saying it like this. If I was raised by the spirit. That same spirit can raise you up. It's not a, again, extra dose or scoop of power. It's the same spirit. Everybody say same spirit. Say it again. Same spirit, right? It's the same spirit that has been extended to us. And if we cultivate our faith. If we build our faith. Now, I'm going to unpack faith in a second. Lord, my time already gone. Mm, mm, mm. I'm I'm, 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 going to unpack it so you understand what I'm talking about. But I want you to just appreciate, beloved, that you have faith. Anyone who comes to God comes because God has activated some faith in you. 
Now, the interesting thing about faith, according to Karl Barth and some of these theologians, is that faith and doubt can exist at the same time. How many have been raised in church and be like, you, man, if you, if you got any doubt, you ain't got no faith. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. Don't you doubt God. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just only believe. I mean, it sounds good. But if I did not have doubt, how would I ever ask a question? Can you imagine if you're in, uh, I'll use my own example of failure, praise God. Uh, <laughs> when I was in physics, you know, I'm in physics with the homies, and you know, this is a time when learning was not something any of us was interested in. We, I don't even know, why would you take physics if you're not trying to learn? Why not take physiology? No hate on physiology. But I realized physiology and physics are two different kinds of monsters. Physiology is kind of the study of, you know, bodies, and physics was stuff I still can't explain today. Theories, formulas, I'm a science fiction guy, so I'm always enamored by these smart people who can get up on a, on a board and just start writing out formulas. And they know what they're talking about. I was watching Interstellar the other day, and they was putting this formula on, on, on travel, just rattling it off. I'm saying to myself, mm mm mm. If I'd have paid attention in physics class, I may know what they're talking about. <laughs> sat there in physics, and I'm next to people who made me feel like a square because there was a moment where I was trying to learn. Oh, McBride, you a little this, you a little that, ha, <laughs> ha, cornball. We, we in here, we just be playing, you know, just, you know, uh, trying to blow up. You know, I remember we did a thing, maybe this was chemistry class. Again, why would I take chemistry? I don't know. We was in chemistry class, and we was in there turning on all the Bunsen burners, you know, and just, just playing around trying to blow up the school and whatnot. <laughs> that's how, that's how, how I was showing up in my science classes. Not with a spirit of learning, but with a spirit of clowning around. And I missed a whole lot of information. Obviously, you know, I could have learned it again when I went to UC Davis, but I flunked out, so still wasn't ready there either, praise God. Thank God I recovered. Amen. And I, the, the, the moral to that part of the story is, you may fail many times, but you can succeed at least once. Just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. But what I realized is that there are some moments in my life where it mattered what I believed about myself over and against what others believed about me and what I believed and learned related to information that I did not yet have, but that was accessible to me. The scripture says that faith is the substance, that which is concrete, that which you hope for, and it is the evidence, the stand-in, of what you cannot see. Let me say it again. Faith is the substance, this is the substance, this could be justice in Palestine, into violence in East Oakland, your marriage and your family being vibrant and life-giving, your children not wilding out. Somebody say, Lord, give me some faith, amen. You finishing your program, you, are, you working on this project, you launching a business, faith is the substance. This is your faith, that which you are hoping for. Listen, and your faith is also the stand-in, the placeholder for what you can't see. Faith is what you hope for, substance, concrete, but it is also the stand-in until it happens. <laughs> I got my faith. Can you believe it before you see it? You gotta have some faith. And the great thing about faith, beloved, according to our theological tradition, is faith is a gift from God. 
You don't even have to initiate your own faith. <laughs> All you got to do is just open up your arms. Your mind, your spirit and say, God, I want faith. I want to be able to have something to hope for and the evidence of it before it happens. I want to be able to walk through life knowing that this faith that you've given to me has accurately reconditioned my eyes and my ears. So when I'm calling for peace and justice in the world, it's not some fanciful dream. It is a result of faith. It has not happened yet, but guess what? It is concrete because it's evidence that it's going to happen. I feel like I'm in physics class trying to teach y'all the Pythagorean thing. Some of y'all look at me like, <laughs> Pastor, you're talking in circles. <laughs> well, here in the text, I, I, let, 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 let me just give you quick three points of, of how I think that you get this kind of faith. The first thing the scripture says to us is that faith in verse 31 is described as something, listen, that is a record, talking about information, of Jesus' activities. Not everything Jesus did, John says, can be held in a book. This should put to some relief for you who have anxiety about how we don't have all the information about Jesus. Is it trustworthy? Some books got 66. Some Bibles got 66 books. Some of us got 88 books. How do I know if what I got is trustworthy? I want you to know that there's enough about Jesus told to us that can cause you to have a faith information that is enough for you to believe that life can happen through the work that Jesus did on the earth. Why is that important? Because the faith that I want to live out needs to be informed by the life of Jesus. This is so important today because, like I often say, there are a lot of Jesus is running around. And if your Jesus is a warmonger, guess what you're going to have a faith for? Warmongering. If your Jesus is a white supremacist, guess what your faith is going to be? Comfortable. Engaging in white supremacy. If your Jesus is a capitalist, guess what you're going to be? Oh, you're going to be a capitalist and feel like Jesus wants me to be a billionaire. I want you to think about this for a second. <laughs> Jesus wants you to be a billionaire. Hmm. Of all the things that Jesus did on the earth. He did. <laughs> Billionaire it, 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 it didn't make the cut. And I want you to appreciate that what we believe about Jesus is that Jesus had access to everything. Jesus could have walked the earth and hoarded everything. Rightly so, because we believe Jesus was a part of the Trinitarian creative moment that created everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of earth. Jesus already owned it all. So technically, I guess Jesus was a billionaire, I guess, is he owned it all. But that was not what Jesus led with. Jesus figured out a way to walk through life, and his faith informs us. I was going to start a Bible study. We're going to do it eventually on the way of Jesus. What is the way of Jesus? Well, he healed the sick. I would say Jesus, the way of Jesus is to make sure that everybody is physically cared for. He fed the hungry. I would say the way of Jesus is to make sure that everybody is fed. He raised the dead. I probably would say the way of Jesus is to make sure that Everybody can live. Just three things. Imagine if every Christian in the world said, you know what? I'm going to make sure every human being has access to health, 
services. I'm not talking about followers of any other religion. I'm talking about all those who follow the way of Jesus. I'm going to make sure every human being has food. I'm going to make sure every human being is protected from violence. Our faith should inform then how we live. How can I follow Jesus and not work to create the conditions where bodies are healed, minds are restored, communities are protected. It then makes the work of justice not just an altruistic endeavor. It means that, man, I am living out a faith informed by Jesus. And guess what, beloved? Some of us, just like the disciples, after Jesus was resurrected, many of them probably thought, man, the Roman Empire is toast. Thank you, Jesus. The revolution has come. No more soldiers. And after a week, Jesus wasn't around, and guess what they did? Locked themselves in a room. Said, I killed much for, so much for the revolution. Guess I got to go back to work tomorrow. Often, the miraculous activity of God will not change your situation overnight. But that faith can change you. So when you go back into your situation, you show up with a different kind of power and confidence and motivation. The great thing about resurrection, my love, is that it gives us access to new information that death does not have the final say. Everybody that I'm dealing with on my job and my family and my neighborhood, I'm showing up differently because I have faith that is informed by resurrection. It's just not a Sunday where we get dressed up, but it is a reminder that I and we have power that can raise the dead. That can remake reality. I want you, I hope you understand, because this is so important for me. I show up in every place believing God has given me power to change environments. By my faith. Now, again, I know I give myself a little litmus test. If my faith, if what I'm trying to change is not life-giving, then that's not my faith. Even if I think it is. Anybody ever thought something was right, then you got into it, like, oh, that, <laughs> that was wrong, sorry. Every follower of Jesus should be a quick apologizer. If it turns out that your instincts trick you. Sometimes you can think you're right and you're wrong. You need to be like, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't the right move. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then you got to correct your behavior. Yeah. Don't be so wedded to your own thoughts or ideas. You can't never realize, uh, my human foibles shine through today. But more often than not, if you show up asking yourself, how can my presence here create more life? <laughs> create more healing. Create more wholeness. That's why I love what Jesus breathed on them and he said, you now have the power to forgive. You can change the spiritual reality through your capacity to say, I forgive. I am forgiven. I'm not going to hold this thing to you. Lord, help me to be better at that because Lord knows I'm not. I can be kind of petty at times with certain people. So my faith has to inform me to be a better forgiver. First set of questions. Your faith informs how you show up. Some of us need a resurrection update. You know, kind of like your phones. Yeah. Right, have your phone, and it's saying your phone needs a system update, and you just keep hitting ignore. Because, yeah. you know, when you get an update on your phone, it shuts your phone down, at least on Apple. And you, you just can't take 10 minutes and not have your phone. What am I, what am I gonna do? I may miss a text. My, 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 you know, I may miss this update. I'm watching, I can't take 10 minutes to let my phone update. 
And so you just don't update your phone. What happens to your phone? It gets slower. You don't get all the perks. Some things are incompatible. How many know some of us need a resurrection update? To your faith. Because your faith is not expanding at the speed and the capacity it could. So you can have the ability to believe it before you see it. Because child of God, if you really believe that Jesus raised from the dead, what then can Jesus not do? Maybe I'm preaching to myself today. Does your faith require a resurrection update? How does your faith inform your worldview and your role and vocation within it? I want to believe that your faith should be like your 3D glasses. When you go into a movie, if you see a movie without 3D glasses and it's 3D, you can see the movie, but it's blurry. Uh -huh. Some moments, and some moments you don't get the full effect. Why would you go through life without your resurrection lenses and miss out on the ways in which God is activating your faith. Everything that we do for the sake of justice, for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of community improvement, for the sake of our families, for the sake, it ought to be infused with this confidence that it's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in my life. And that faith is informing me. Second thing, faith transforms. I love this part. The scripture says that after Jesus said this to the disciples, Jesus walked through their locked doors. Listen, Jesus walked through their closed doors. Jesus walked through their locked and closed doors to make an introduction, reintroducing himself to them. And that process of Jesus walking through closed doors, reintroducing himself to them, transformed them. Your faith informs you. Guess what? Your faith also transforms you. You cannot and will not stay the same when you get a reintroduction of Jesus. Power to your life. They're in here afraid. All of a sudden, Jesus reintroduced himself, and now they feel with joy and confidence. Are there some places in your life where you feel like, man, I need a reintroduction? Because the Jesus I heard about is a little, you know, irrelevant to me. Kind of weak. Kind of like an opiate for the masses. Kind of seems like it's okay bombing people and killing folk and oppressing people. I don't want to follow that Jesus. Guess what? I don't either. That's why I don't. I don't follow the Jesus of some of these wicked folk. That Jesus is a figment of their imagination. But there is a Jesus out there that walks through your shut door. That knows how to pick the locks of your heart. That knows how to heal those parts of you that have remained wounded for decades. That Jesus, when it's reintroduced to you, has the capacity to transform you from a, a harmed, injured human being to someone that exudes life, that exudes possibilities, that exudes the ability to believe it before you can see it. Are there parts of your life in need of a faith transformation? Are there parts of your life where you need to believe it before I see it? God, I know I've had enough experiences where I've been dropped by people. I've been let down. I've had unmet expectations. I've showed up to try to do things and be things and it keeps falling to the ground. I'm here to tell you, what a great day to reintroduce the kind of power that comes from Jesus that says that you can believe it today. Faith, concrete, substance, evidence. Yeah. You can hold that in your hand as a placeholder because that same spirit, that same faith is active right now. And I want us to be a people who can move with confidence through the world when all the forces of hate, when all the forces of violence when all the forces of subjugation and negation and erasure and, and, and being gaslit, all these things are coming to get you. I want us to be people who can stand in the confidence of our faith and say, I will not move. Yeah. Of a
being someone who loves the unlovable. I will not move over being someone who can help those who are on the margins. I will not move over, over this space where I can believe that the same uh, uh, harm and the same trauma that I've had to endure, I can be healed and not inflict that on someone else. I will not be moved. I will be transformed. I will be a new creature. And then there's a faith that propels you. Faith informs you. Faith transforms you. And this faith propels you. This is what Jesus told the disciples. As the Father, the divine parent, the heavenly source of all that is alive, as this power, this, this divine source has sent me, Jesus says to them, now I am sending you. Jesus is sending you. What you think about this? You are on an assignment from God. <laughs> oh, no, Pastor, I think that's your job. <laughs> I'm not. I don't work for God. I, I work, I, I work for, for, for Google. No! <laughs> I work for Kaiser. No, 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 no. They, they, they may employ you, but you work for God. You have been sent into every nook and cranny of the Bay Area. If I were to do an assessment, an asset map on this wall, of where all of us in this room, I don't know all of you, but I just know this is how God works. If I were to do an asset map of all of us on this wall of where we are in the Bay Area, we would be in every nook and cranny of this Bay Area. I'm talking about schools, corporations, therapeutic spaces, neighborhoods. We'd be on all kinds of stratifications of class, gender, orientation. We'd be a wonderful, uh, 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 a wonderful kaleidoscope of God divinely sending you Amen. Amen. out into the world. We all not the same. We all ain't going, we don't leave here tomorrow and then all of us show up and you see Berkeley together. <laughs> Great seeing you yesterday at church and we just <laughs> here for another reunion. God is sending you to be a witness, a declaration of justice, hope, love, healing in the world. And to do it in a way that brings life. I want you, beloved, to believe whatever God has placed in you is manifesting before you see it. Where you've been placed, God has placed something unique. How many are working on what you think is a groundbreaking project on your job? I want you to believe it before you see it. How many are building a family that breaking the cycle of the family you had before? Anybody, anybody? I want you to believe it before. How many of you are going to the doctor this week and you know you need a different diagnosis? I want you to believe it before you. How many of you know that your faith is brittle? It's a little on the rocks. And you're trying to figure out, is this going to happen? I want you to believe it before you see it. Because blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Let me tell you what that word bless. It don't mean like you a bad person if you don't. It just means you get an early benefit. Because you all along are believing. This is about to happen. I ain't got to walk around. Oh my goodness, is it going to happen? I'm clicking my heels. I'm <laughs> throwing stuff over my shoulder. I'm, I'm, I'm walking on a certain side of the street. I'm, 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 I'm saying quotes every day and reading, looking at, looking at the palms and the horoscopes because I'm just trying to get an indication. 
Is it going to happen? Blessed just means I have confidence. And I'm showing up in the world. How do I know justice is going to come to the world? Because it is an expression of my faith. But faith don't let you off the hook to do no work now. Faith causes you to be propelled, to be sent, to do. So everything I do when I'm feeding the hungry, it is an act of my faith. When I'm writing this essay, it is an act to my faith. When I'm producing this training, it's an act. When I'm building this business, it is an act. When I'm doing all the things that I'm doing day to day, it is an act. And guess what? At the end of the day, we pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Stay with me, everybody. We're getting ready to pray. I know I said I was going to preach for 20 minutes, and I preached for 35. Lord, help me to be less long-winded next time. If you believe it before you see it, maybe I will next time. I wouldn't hold your breath, though. No, I'm just Grab the hand of somebody next to you. God, I want to invite you into the life of my beloved who I'm touching today. We need to believe it before we see it. We want to receive it, God. The gift of faith. We want to activate it, and I pray that it would be activated in the life of who I'm touching today. They are between a place of doubt and unbelief. But I remember, God, the words of the man in the scripture who you asked if he believed that you could heal his daughter. His response to you was not. A response that is unlike many of our responses. But his response to you, God, was, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So, God, today, we pray this prayer. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Lord, I believe. believe. Help my unbelief. We pray these prayers together because we exist in both a place of faith and doubt in so many parts of our lives. But we say thank you, God, that just the acknowledgement of our faith and doubt unlocks new faith. So we pray it again. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, whether I'm a student at UC Berkeley or Stanford or, or Mills or San Francisco State, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Whether I'm trying to get this project done, whether I'm trying to launch this business, whether I'm trying to raise these children, whether I'm trying to keep my family together, we pray this prayer, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Whether I'm someone, God, who's trying to wrestle with why evil persists in the world, why war and genocide and famine happens and you're supposed to be a good God, Lord, I know that I'm stuck in between a place of questioning, is any of this real? I still pray this prayer, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, I see death. I see pain. I see violence. I see suffering. But I know that you have come that we all would have life and have life abundantly. You've come to put an end to the exploitation and the wicked in the world. You have come to raise up a church that is without spot or blemish, that is unified in loving creation. And God, we see the exact opposite of that. We pray this prayer, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, I pray that you will help us as we both struggle with our belief and our unbelief. And may we, God, tap into the gift of faith that allows us to believe it before we can see it. We want the blessing of being able to believe that things are changing. Things are getting better. Before they actually happen, we want to tap in to the blessing of confidence. That whether I'm in the neighborhood, whether I'm on the university, whether I'm in the political space, whether I'm in the social service or the public health space, whether I'm at home with my children, whether I'm in the schoolhouse, God, I want to walk with confidence to know that every act I take that is life giving, that is defeating the enemy. It is an expression of my faith that believes it before I can see it. 
And I say, thank you. Lift those hands now right where you are. God, walk through the closed doors in my life. Walk through the locked doors in my life. Walk through the places that I have shut up as a defense mechanism that keeps me from believing the possibility of what you can do. I need to be saved from my fear. I need to be saved from my slow self-esteem. I need to be saved from my despair. I need to be saved from my, my, my doubt. I need to be saved, God, from that which cripples me from showing up as a resurrected follower of you. Save me. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Come on, lift those hands. Save me. Somebody say, save me, Lord. God, give me supernatural strength so I can be someone who believes it before I see it and I can walk with confidence. We say thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, for all that you will do, and we declare and decree today that faith is within my grasp. It is even within me right now. We say thank you, Lord, for faith that sees it before it happens. Come on, give God a praise today if this is your heart's prayer and your heart's desire.